everybody. Welcome virtually to the North Carolina Zoo. My name is Leslie. Very excited to kind of hang out with you all virtually today. Um, I'm the school programs coordinator here at the North Carolina Zoo. You may have seen my face around if you also have checked out Facebook Lives before. Um, and I'm really excited because this program that I'm bringing you all today is probably one of my favorites. It's super fun and you got to use a lot of that like um, the the strategic or critical thinking and and putting clue, taking clues and putting them together and using that scientific method too. So creating hypotheses and saying, you know, I have all this stuff together. I think it might be this and then trying to find out if you're correct or not. Because today I'm going to teach you all a little bit about how we can be bone detectives. Uh, so we're going to be using a bunch of these bones. Most of them are plastic versions of it. Um, and we're going to be learning all about the things that we can figure out just by looking at these bones. And I also have some really fun live animals with us today as well that I can't wait for you all to meet. Before I get started though, a couple of quick kind of just um, run throughs and tips of how to make this a super fun and interactive day um, or next hour. And that is you've been able to get in on that chat box or you've been able to get into the classroom today. Everybody's mics were muted for security reasons. So nobody is able to talk directly to us via microphone, but that does not mean you cannot interact with us. We do have a question and answering box that you can send any questions that you have, then those questions will be sent to us and then we should hopefully be able to answer some of them, maybe most of them online or on air right now. If we're not able to get to all those questions, that's okay. Um, feel free to send questions on our Facebook page to if you needed them answered as well. Um, so once again, everybody, that Q&A box is where you're gonna be sending all of your questions for us. All right, so one last thing. Um, since we are speaking virtually, there is always that lag between kind of when I'm talking to when you get it and then you're able to type a question back. So um, I may sometimes have a little bit of a pause to wait um, to see if you all can answer back. Or also I may kind of throw out some hints in between so that I can get those brain juices flowing um, and those answers coming. Cause this is a, I think this is a pretty fun interactive program. Is everybody ready? I hope you're as excited as I am. So uh, we will have some people maybe answering questions as well. Um, so if you have anybody answer you a question uh, specifically, that might be um, one of our employees here. They are answering virtually from their home. So we give them a wave right now. And then Nikki is actually here with me um, at the zoo and she's manning our camera. So she's, uh, um, it, it's, everybody give her a nice wave as well. <laughs> All right, everybody. So for bone detectives today, we are going to find out ways and things that we can learn from just looking at bones. As anybody might have gone out and kind of like seen maybe a bone in a park or if you have a backyard, um, just kind of laying around. Um, and because bones don't go away, once the animal has passed on, the bones will stay there. Um, and you might've been like, oh, uh, you know what? I'm not sure what exactly this is. Well, I'm here to tell you some tips of how to maybe figure out what that bone is, or at least tell some things just from it. So one of the first things that you can usually tell just by looking at a bone is kind of like, if the animal is big or little. So let's try it out, okay? I'm gonna show you some bones and then we're gonna see if we think that that came from a big animal or a little animal. You ready? All right. <laughs> what do you think about this? This bone right here, do you think this came from a big animal or a little animal? I'll uh, put it, it's pretty much half of me. Now, that being said, I'm not a very tall person. So, big. you know, not that big. doesn't really mean that much. But great answers, everybody. Yes, this is from a big animal. Um, and the reason we're able to tell that is because, well, it's pretty large. A lot of times when we think about bones, we can kind of compare them to ourselves because we, we can kind of put it right next to our body and say, you know what, I do know that this is not a backbone and this is pretty big compared to me so this animal is probably bigger than i am all right what about let's see what about this animal 
Do you think this came from a big animal or a little animal? <laughs> if you said big, well, somebody said small. <laughs> you are correct. This is actually, and this one's a little bit of a trick one because this is a tooth. <laughs> this is one tooth. So if our teeth, if you think about our teeth compared to this one tooth, this is going to be a much bigger animal. What about something like this? Do you think this came from a big animal or a little animal? And I mean like bigger than us or little, smaller than us. How about that? Small. Yeah, so this would be smaller than us. So you can usually tell, and you can even maybe look, most of the stuff that I brought today is actually from larger animals, because I wanted to be able to make sure that you all could see them very well, since I'm not able to walk up and kind of show you everything. Um, but usually, the smaller the bones, the smaller the animal. The bigger the bones, the bigger the animal. It's pretty good, pretty easy. Um, another thing, though, that you can tell just by looking at the bones is, what part of the body the bone came from. So we're going to look at some of those bones that we just saw and see if we can figure out what part of the body that bone may have come from. Okay, so get your thinking caps on. What do we think? So we have this one. I'm going to get another one. Though. What do we think? What part of the body do you think that this came from? So was it from its foot? Is it head. from its head? head. I'm seeing a lot of heads. Very good. Yeah. So it did. It came from this is a skull. And the way that I'm able to explain that, because the way that I think about it sometimes educating is trying to explain something to somebody, uh, to something to someone who has never heard of it before. And a lot of times we think, well, I know that's a skull because I know what skulls look like. But what exactly are you looking and thinking of when you see a skull? And the way that I usually describe it is I see those eye sockets, kind of that rounder shape. And then I see this hooked part that looks kind of like a mouth, right? And so because eyes and mouths tend to be on heads, on skulls, then I know just by looking at this, if I can see the eyes and I can see that mouth, that this came from a skull. What animal? Oh, what animal? So great question. This is a bald eagle. And so birds actually have pretty small skulls and skeletons, even though they're pretty big. So this is a bald, a bald eagle one, which a, a, a live bald eagle um, is about this tall. Like I said, I'm not very tall. I'm five feet, but, but they are pretty large birds. What about, we saw this one earlier, what part of the body do you think this came from? Did you think, think maybe the back, the skull, the arm, the leg? Hmm. Some legs. Legs. Great job, everybody. Leg. And the way that I usually am able to describe how I know this came from the leg is that it's one solid long bone. Does anybody know what the longest bone in our body is? Like our body, one single bone. Anybody know what that is? see longest single bone in a human body i'll give you a hint it's this bone right here <laughs> does anybody know what that bone's called it's called the femur bone so if you were thinking about it but not sure if you wanted to type it in good job everybody and if you didn't know now you know so this is a femur bone. This is a leg or thigh bone. So good job. You knew it was part of the leg. Now, if you, if any, does anybody want to guess what they think, what animal this came from? So we said big animal, right? This is a thigh bone. This thigh bone is half the size of me. Does anybody know anything very tall? An animal that's very, very tall? Hanging out right by. <laughs> Let's see. If you're thinking yeah. this animal right here, <laughs> the giraffe, you are correct. It is a giraffe yeah. leg bone. Oh, sorry. Giraffe <laughs> femur. All right. So what other ones did I have? Oh, yes. 
this right here. What part of the animal's body do you think this came from? Hand, foot, claws, wing. All right, so we're seeing those are all great guesses. So we have oh, flipper up seal. We have hands, claws, foot, and yeah, I see the these claws, hand. and that makes me think hand or foot. It is kind of like a a weird shape, so it makes me think of something that maybe doesn't use each one of those fingers. And if you said I, we got somebody to say the flipper of a seal, you're correct. This is from a seal. And it kind of looks like this. This is what a sea lion's flipper would look like. So you have all of this kind of fat and skin, but then you still have those five digits in there. So they do have five fingers, just like we have five fingers as well. Theirs is just kind of like paddles, basically. Good job, everybody. What about, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's like I've missed it. It was right in front of my face. <laughs> what about this? What part of the body do you think this is from? <laughs> Very good, everybody. Foot. This is foot. And kind of one of the ways that it's easy to tell, too, is because it literally stands the way that you think of a foot. Um, anybody want to guess what if animal's foot this is? And I'll, I'll give you a hint. Yes, it does only have two toes. When I first started working at the zoo, I thought this was broken because <laughs> I thought there was supposed to be another toe right there. Said, let's see. I got a flamingo. Flamingo. Kangaroo. Okay. Uh, ostrich. Okay. Well, ostrich is the one. Yeah, good guesses though. Flamingo, it is a, like birds. They are similar. Um, kangaroos do have those very large feet and we're going to talk about um, them in a, in a bit as well. But this is an ostrich. So ostriches only have two toes. That's how I'm able to tell that this is an ostrich and not other um, birds. But it, those nice big talons, those claws, and that's how we know kind of by the way that it's shaped. Um, it looks like an ankle, leg, foot. Good job, everybody. So you can just by the, the locate or just by knowing kind of like roughly the shape of the bone, you usually can kind of tell where it is in their body as well. Now, this one is one of my favorites um, because one, because it's weird shaped. Does anybody want to guess what part of an animal's body this came from? I'm gonna turn it around so you can see the top and then the sides. Back and spine. Okay, so we have back and spine. Oh, someone said vertebrae. Vertebrae, great words, everybody. So yeah, it is a vertebrae, which is part of the back and spine. Now, this is a specific part of the back and spine. Um, here's a hint. This is one bone of it. And if you think about with us, our spine, very, very small bones. So this is gonna be a really large animal. The animal that has these, these um, vertebrae, they are literally stacked one on top of each other, and there's seven of them. Same amount of bones that we have in this part in our spine too. I wonder if anybody might be able to get it from that. So seven of these stacked on top of each other, Anybody think, and it's just one section of their spine. Any thoughts? This one's a hard one. Lumbar spine, giraffe vertebrae. It is a giraffe vertebrae, yeah. So our, it is going to be part of the neck, part of the neck. So we have seven neck bones, though so does the giraffe. Theirs is just, you know, much bigger, much, much more large. Um, Great, and also great use of specific parts of the, the back, like lumbar and cervical, and um, oh, there's thoracic. Um, those are <laughs> all of those. Um, so we are able, like I said, to tell just by looking at the bones what part of their body they are as well. So size of animal, where in the body that bone is from, and there are even some, like, I don't have them with me, um, but there's even some bones that are only found in certain animals that you don't find in other animals. So like birds, if, if you've ever heard of the wishbone um, in a bird, that is actually kind of like the top of their keel bone. So they have a keel bone that has kind of this weird bone that's attached to it that helps with their flight and their wings. So only birds have that keel bone, and it kind of looks like, kind of looks like a sail 
with like a little bit of bone at the bottom of it. Um, it's very long and thin, almost kind of like just this part of the vertebrae, not all that other part though. So if you find something that you're like, I've never seen this before, it's possible that it's from an animal, that that's the only type of animal or group of animal that has those bones in it. So some other things that you can tell just by looking at the bones of an animal is sometimes you can tell if that animal was healthy or not. And this is kind of a neat little story um, that we have. This is a real skeleton from a kawadi. If anybody knows what a kawadi is, it's kind of like, I always describe it as kind of like a raccoon from South America, a weird looking raccoon. And there's something on this kawadi that is a little bit different than it should be. Is anybody able to see something that looks maybe like it's not, the bone wasn't kind of formed properly or isn't doing so well? So I'm kind of showing it you right now. If you see those two big teeth in the front, and sorry, I'm a little shaky. <laughs> if you see those two big teeth in the front, they kind of look like, um, not, they're not super healthy. They're kind of a little scratchy looking. They're a little shaped a little bit different than they should be. Um, they kind of bow out a little bit more than, than um, normally the Kawadi's te front teeth do. It almost looks like it has cavities um, or it would have cavities. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, yeah, the reason is, is because this Kawadi was actually found roaming the streets. And so somebody called the zoo and said, hey, there's a kawadi, or a, a, they may not have known what it was at that point. They're like, there's a weird animal <laughs> um, kind of just wandering around that looks like it's not supposed to be there. And so we were able to bring that kawadi in and then take care of it at the North Carolina Zoo. But when we were doing checkup on it to make sure everything was healthy, we did notice that its teeth weren't very good. And so that made us believe that that kawadi probably was not getting a proper diet for a very long time and eating very sugary stuff. Um, so even though we were able to then give the Kawadi a proper diet, the teeth were still kind of too far gone. So you can look at the Kawadi's teeth on the skeleton and tell that it didn't have a proper diet for a certain amount of time of its life. All right, so you can tell the health of the animal. And then one of the other really cool things that you can tell by looking at bones is how that animal gets around, like how, what its locomotion would be. And the way that I'm going to show this is I'm actually going to bring out a friend. So hold on one second. Um, and if you want to try to figure out maybe what it is, you can right now. I'll be right back. So we can tell just by looking at the skeleton of an animal, usually how that animal would get around. Now I have to put on gloves to handle this animal. Now I'm going to bring it over here. All right. Anybody guess what they thought the animal is? Maybe the putting on gloves might help. <laughs> Not a prey. <laughs> <laughs> also, good guess because I would have to wear gloves, but different type of gloves. That's a really good guess. So I'm just talking about I had to put on kind of these types of gloves, not the glove that I would have to wear if I had one of our birds. I would definitely have to wear a thick glove because of their talons. But this guy, I have to wear a glove as well. And that's because, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> Any guesses? Wrong. Some frogs? Toad. It's a, a toad. <laughs> yeah, so it is related to a frog. This is actually a toad, and they do look very similar. Somebody said a cane toad. Well done. This is, in fact, a cane toad. And I'm sorry if I just got much louder. I'm a really loud person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much closer to the microphone now. I'll, I'll talk less loud. This is a cane toad. And um, the reason I'm holding it the way that I am is because that's the best for their body structure. Um, they have, I'm going to go get the, here is what their, their skeleton actually looks like. This is a frog skeleton. But if you kind of see right here, 
that part of its skeleton is very delicate. It's got very thin bones in it. And so if we are gonna, we were to hold the frog there, we could accidentally hurt it or the toad there, we could accidentally hurt it. So because of that, I hold it down by its waist. And these bones are thicker and stronger. And so it is more, it is, um, it is better for the safety of the toad to handle it like this, even though it kind of looks funny. What's his name? Oh, great question. So this is Todd. This is Todd the toad. You may also see me handle him like this, um, but that's not me holding on to something really. Um, if I have to kind of show you, then I do it this way. Um, this is Todd the toad, Todd the cane toad. Good job, whoever knew that. And they are also known as a giant marine toad. So if we were to look at the, you can kind of see just by looking at the actual toad, um, they are designed to jump. And their skeleton and the way that their leg bones and feet bones are makes them adapted to jumping. Does anybody know what on the skeleton of the toad is different than maybe some animals that aren't jumping animals. Any guesses? And this right here has a really good depiction of it because they're kind of all the way out. Any guesses? Back legs, pelvis, the legs. Yeah, those back legs. So if we look right where that small, tiny pelvis and then those really long back legs and also really long back feet, that is a body structure of an animal that jumps. Um, and the reason is, is because they need very strong, powerful legs to push. And then they need very short front legs to not get in the way, basically. So because the toad has those very long back legs and a long back foot, it can push itself and propel itself forward much easier than say animals that don't have that body structure. Yeah. I'm talking about that. Somebody wants to know what's the difference between a frog and a toad? Great question. So frogs and toads, they both have very similar body structures, but the toad structure is a, the skeleton is a little bit, I would say shorter. I actually have one. So I was showing you a frog skeleton, and then this is a toad skeleton. So you can kind of see that the toad is more squat, I would say, or just kind of more round and short than, um, or the, yeah, the toad is. Frogs are more kind of like long and lean. But it can also be really hard to tell them apart, because if you don't have um, a skeleton and you just see one like this, how do you know, right? So one of the ways that I know is because I've learned um, their frog calls and kind of what the toads look like around here. Um, our toads around here, the most common ones, and by around here, I mean North Carolina, um, the, the most common ones that I know of are um, Fowler toads and American toads, and they look almost identical. But they tend to have this more kind of rough skin um, they, they tend to not be around water as much, and they also tend to have like little shorter faces. Um, but the easiest way for me to tell the difference between a frog and toad is actually looking at their eggs, which is kind of neat. So toads, when they lay eggs, they lay eggs in one long string. So an egg after an egg after an egg. A frog lays eggs in kind of a big mass. So it just looks like a big blob of eggs. And that's the like easiest way that I've been able to tell them apart. But great question. I have another one. Okay. <laughs> uh, why is it called a cane toad? Great question. Why is it called a cane toad? So it's called a cane toad actually because of its really interesting story. We've learned a lot from this animal. Um, and we've learned a lot of things not to do from this animal. So um, cane toads um, are named after sugar cane basically. Um, so we have Todd the toad, and we also have Sugar the cane toad, um, who's not with us, well, not with us here today. She is in her habitat. Um, and um, years and tens, many years ago, um, not like hundreds of years ago, but uh, several decades ago, um, there were a bunch of beetles in Australia that were eating the sugar cane, 
and sugar comes from sugar cane. So we love our sugar, right? Um, and so people there said, you know, how do we get, we don't want to use pesticides. We want to do something, nat a natural way to get rid of these cane, uh, these sugar cane beetles. And so what they thought was, well, what if we found a frog or toad that could eat them, but not eat anything else kind of around there. They would just eat the beetles. And what they did is they found the cane toad or the giant marine toad. The problem was is the giant marine toad lives in South America. So what they did is they took the giant marine toad from South America and they flew them over to Australia and released them. And the cane toad not only ate almost everything around there, it was able to kind of take over and it was eating other frogs, it was eating other beetles, and it did nothing about the sugarcane beetles. So there was still a problem with the sugarcane beetles. And because of that, they became bigger and stronger and took over and they even venture further and further now. Um, they are what we consider an invasive species. They were introduced um, and now they are invasive in Australia. So they are doing too well in Australia. Um, and so because of that, we learned it's not, it's not good for us to take animals from one place and introduce them into another place. And we don't do that anymore. But that's why cane toad, sugar cane. Great questions. Do you know how old he is? Do we know how old he is? I don't know exactly how old he is. He is an adult. <laughs> yeah. He is not young. He is an adult. So I don't know exactly how old he is, but he's been here almost as long of, as I've been at the zoo. Um, and I'm coming up on four years. So I think he's probably at least three. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. So somebody said, I just read in a magazine that frogs breathe through their skin. Great observation. Awesome. Awesome that you're reading articles about these guys. Ah, I love, I love learning about them. And you're right. So they can breathe through their skin and they can take moisture through their skin. And that's the biggest reason why I'm wearing these gloves, because anything that's on my hands can go into the cane toad's body. And so if I, we've been, we've been washing our hands way more than normal and putting hand sanitizer on our hands, well, even though that's cleaning our hands, if that goes into the cane toad, that could really make him sick. And that's uh, the same for all amphibians. And so because of that, whenever we handle amphibians, we always wear gloves to make, to protect the actual animal. But yes, so they can, they can, they can take in water through their skin and they can um, breathe through their skin as well. So why does it have that skin color? Why does it have this skin color? So um, it kind of has this kind of brown and I call it mottled. So it's like little specks. Um, and the reason it does is so I don't know exactly why it's this color, but my best guess would be for camouflage. So these are going to be hanging out in, um, in areas where there's a lot of brown soil or even maybe leaves and they hang out on the grounds and maybe hide under tree, um, fall in tree trunks and stuff like that. And so being this color will allow them to, um, will allow them to blend in with their surroundings. Um, and then also like the little, the little parts of white, that's if, if you were to be, if you, the sun was shining down like through a bunch of leaves, it doesn't look all just one color. It's kind of that speckled color. So these are all great questions, everybody, but we, we have more that we need to learn and I have more animals to show you. So everybody say goodbye to our friend Todd, who showed us how those nice big long back legs and front legs, um, uh, short front legs make him a jumper. Another type of, another type of um, animal or um, body structure for a movement of animal is going to be this one right here. This is a zebra foot. So we think of zebras and they're kind of like similar to the size of um, horses, um, domestic horses that we have around um, in the United States. We also have wild horses in the United States as well. And think about how horses get around. Does anybody know how horses get around? Do they jump like the frogs and toads? I do a lot of this. <laughs> so zebras, if you said they run, walk, they walk run. or run, yeah, that is how a zebra gets around. So why 
Does anybody know why having a leg and foot like this helps them run or walk? <laughs> run, walk, gallop, run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why would having a foot and hoof like this help? Is it a big one? Is it, is it a big hoof? Is it a little hoof compared to the rest of the, um, the horse or rest of the zebra? And this is reduces impact of shock. Uh, very cool, yeah. So that's small, it's true. That less that kind of less surface area, they're able to, and they're the way that their bones are as well, they're able to take all that shock absorbing when they're running. And having the small foot also allows them basically not to get into their own way. If you think about it, um, uh, even things like cheetahs or all animals that kind of run or walk, they tend to have fairly small paws or very fairly small hoofs um, so that the, they don't get in their way. It's the smallest amount to be able to just kind of propel them um, or move them forward. So this small hoof allows them to basically get as little of their body onto the ground so they can move quicker. It's kind of a neat question. So yeah. why is the hoof not black? Why is the hoof not black? Great question. So the reason this hoof is not black is because this is just the bone. Um, if you think about um, foot structure, they do still, they, they have here, this would be part of its tibula fibula. Um, and then they would have basically like an ankle. And then this is their foot or their toe almost. Um, and then there is a bony part and then they have a protective shield over that. That's the actual hoof. It's not made out of bone. It's made out of a different material. Um, it's made out of basically the same thing as like your hair. Um, so keratin, um, and, or if you think about like scoots on a turtle as well, that extra protective shield. And that's basically so that um, the bone itself stays nice and protective, and then most of the wear and tear gets on the hoof. The hoof itself, that shield part, um, it is what is black, not the actual bone. Great question. Nice observation skills, too. So one of the ways that I describe that, though, is that if you've ever put on, like when I was really young, I would put on my dad's shoes, still do it sometimes when I go and visit him and I have to run outside, I'll put on his flip flops. Um, but um, if you put on big shoes or if you've ever worn like clown shoes or those kind of flippers for um, diving, scuba diving, um, if you try to walk in those, so much of that extra part of the shoe or the, um, the flipper gets in your way and it makes it very hard for you to move quickly. So the smaller that foot is, the smaller the hoof, the smaller the paw, the easier it is to move quickly ahead. Great job. All right, so one of my other favorite ones, and I'm gonna show you this first and then I'm gonna bring out my friend, is this animal right here. Does anybody know what this animal is? Just by looking at our skeleton. one of my favorite animals in the world. This animal scares a lot of people snake. too. Snake, very good, yes. This is a snake skeleton. And a lot of times people will say, well, I didn't know snakes had bones. I thought that they, how were they able to kind of like curve and, and do cute. all that stuff? Thank you, snakes are cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, how are they able to do that? I thought they wouldn't have to have bones. They do in fact have bones. They just have, let's see how close I can get. They just have very small bones. So as I'm kind of going down, you can see all those tiny, tiny, tiny little bones. And it's just like your backbone, except their whole entire body is a backbone, basically. So if you think about it, we can move our backbone kind of like a snake back forward. But then we get to your hips and it stops. <laughs> so if you think about a snake, it's just that backbone and it extends all the way down their body. But while I'm so getting- they like ribs. They do also have, it's also, they're basically just a giant backbone and ribs, right? And those ribs are very, very delicate. So they have to have a lot of muscle um, to, and those scales to be able to protect them. So I have a question for you while I'm going and gonna get my friend. And my question is, what, how do you think this body shape, that one long line helps them get around. Think about how they would get around. Do they run? Do they walk? Do they climb? Do they jump? 
that's my question for you while I go get my friend. And Nikki, you can just yell out answers at people. <laughs> yeah, slither. Slither, they do slither. Are they good climbers? Let's see. Has anybody ever seen a snake climb? Said yes. Yeah, so snakes are excellent climbers. And one of the ways that they're climbers is because they have a very, very long body, just kind of like a long limb on a monkey. If you think about like chimpanzees or any other types of, um, of primates that climb and swing, they tend to have really long arms. Um, and that allows them to climb and to swing. And the snake is just one giant long arm, basically. And then having those tiny, tiny little bones allows them to wrap around stuff as well. So this is Griffin. Um, Griffin is a pine snake and pine snakes are found in North Carolina. So if you live in North Carolina, you could potentially see this type of snake, but pine snakes tend to live underground. So for the most part, we don't see them as much as we see like the Eastern rat snakes, which are um, about the same length, but they're all black. Um, so let's see if we can get Griffin to come say hello to everybody. Um, and so Griffin is very, um, he's a very oh, cute, a small head? <laughs> he's a very curious snake. And so a lot of times he'll kind of check stuff out <laughs> See, <That's awesome. laughs> he'll kind of check stuff out. So he was very interested in the that um, that lens earlier. Um, so one person asked, "Why does he have such a small head?" And he does have a pretty small head in comparison to the rest of his body. Um, and the reason is is because he doesn't need a very large head. He needs to be able to dig and climb around. And the, this part of his body is more important for his locomotion than really his head is. Though he's very special. He has um, a special scale at the tip of his mouth. I don't know if you can see it, kind of like where his nose is, that allows him to dig. And he uses it kind of like a shovel, basically. Um, he also kind of has these scales on the tops of his eyes that make him look like he, um, he's mean, he kind of looks like he's like, uh, what's going on? And that, those are also protective um, as he's digging that they protect his eyes from the ground. So snakes, one really cool thing about snakes as well is that they don't need massive heads. And they don't need massive heads because they have a very special structure of jaw and mouth. These snakes can eat, let's see if he'll, Sometimes he'll kind of wrap around my whole entire body um, or my waist, and we'll see if maybe he'll do that so I can show you. Nope, he's not into it. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, maybe, 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 nope, okay. Um, so he has a very special jaw. Everybody touch your chin. So your chin right here, that is one big jaw bone that you have. Well, snakes don't have a full jawbone like that. They have a bone that goes down one side to here, and then they have a bone that goes down the other side to here. They don't actually have a bone in the middle that um, connects. So what, they what they're able to do, hold on one second, let me get him a little more relaxed. <laughs> what they do is they're able to open their jaw one side and then the other side away from each other. So they're literally able to open it like this. Then they also have an extra bone in the back of their jaw. Now, I don't know, maybe you learned, um, I, when I was a kid, I was told that they could literally like unhinge their jaw, but that's actually um, not quite, quite correct. They do have an extra bone back there that allows them to open their jaw even wider than normal. So they're able to open their jaw this way extra wide and this way extra wide. And that's why they're able to eat stuff that's so big compared to the size of their head. They don't need to have it. They have a special jaw that allows them to eat instead. Okay, 
question. Sure. So is it poisonous and it, how do you tell if it's poisonous or not? Great question. So we got asked if he was poisonous and then how do you tell if they're poisonous or not? So I'm going to be a little bit of a stickler right now. Mm -hmm. um, and poison, if you say poisonous snake, a lot of people will understand what you're saying. So um, it's, you know, it's not the, the, the um, it's not that we, you're not saying something that people won't understand. But when we're talking about straight scientifically, there is a difference between poisonous and venomous. And venomous means that it's injected through like fangs or bee sting. Um, and poison means that it kind of secretes or it pushes out toxin. Its whole entire body is toxic. So venomous would be a snake. Snakes would have fangs and they would bite to have to inject the venom. He is a non-venomous snake, first because I would never be holding a venomous snake like this. This would be too dangerous. Um, all of the people here at the zoo that work with venomous snakes, they have to have very specific protocols that they, they abide by, and they have to always let people know when they're working with them. And we also have anti-venom anti on site at all times. Um, so this is a non-venomous snake. So he is not able, if he were to bite me, which he's never done, um, and wouldn't need to because he feels comfortable, um, then I, I wouldn't have any venom injected in me. It still is not something that I want to happen. I don't like to be bit by animals, but you are less likely to be bit by a snake um, than like a, my rabbit. I have a rabbit and he likes to bite all day, every day. <laughs> um, so these guys, this is a non-venomous snake. So things that are poisonous, um, think about like poison arrow frogs or po poison ivy. So things that you kind of have to rub against your skin or to eat to make you sick. So non-venomous, he's non-venomous. Question? Yeah. Why is he called a pine snake? Great question. Why is he called a pine snake? So um, I forgot his name, Griffin. <laughs> Griffin is called a pine snake because they're found in pine forests a lot. Um, these tend to live down in North Carolina. They tend to live down in the pine forests of um, like the sand hills and they live underground. So you don't see them very often. They can live around here, um, around Ashboro and where we are right now, but they tend to be where there's a lot of pine trees and that's where they got their name, the pine snake. Any other questions before I let my friend go back? <laughs> well, if you want to answer that one on, on you. <laughs> Let's see. Do they live in pine straw? The, so that was the, one of them was, do they live in pine straw? And the answer is yes, in a sense, because since the pine trees will drop some of the pine leaves every once in a while, not all of it, um, they do tend to live underground near pine straw. Um, so I'm gonna, if you have any questions, you can keep asking them while I'm putting him back. But um, our friend Griffin, he is that long limb basically that allows him to climb super easily. Now snakes, this doesn't have to do with their, um, their bones, but snakes also, their scales can be used kind of like um, fingernails. So they have on their belly, they have scales that on one side are not kind of attached all the way to the end. And then those can be used to kind of hook on trees. All right. So he is super awesome, right? I love Griffin. Um, he's also one. So we have lots of different snakes that I handle. And a lot of them, like ball pythons and even our king snake, they tend to just kind of like wrap around you and hang out there. And Griffin is one of my most fun to handle because he is so inquisitive and he kind of is always seeing what's going on. And he's not no, a type of snake that's known for kind of just wrapping and sitting in one way or one area. They are known for being very active and moving around. So the body structures that we learn, those nice long back legs and short front legs, that's for jumping. We had those small feet for running and then long limbs or long bodies for climbing. I'm gonna kind of go to another area now to talk about just something in the skull um, and see how you could tell if a animal is an animal that eats meat 
an animal that eats vegetables or an animal that eats both meat and vegetables. Now, what are the more scientific -y names for an animal that only eats meat or an animal that only eats vegetables or an animal that eats both meat and vegetables? Any guesses? So it's something of vor. For here's an example. Yeah, carnivore for me. <laughs> uh, carnivore Some for me. Yes. Carnivores. There you go. Yes. Omnivores. Omnivores would be for everything, which so I call them om nom nom omnivores because they like to om nom nom everything. Um, and carnivores are for um, just meat. And then we heard vegetarian, and vegetarian's not wrong. It is correct. They are vegetarians. But we were looking for the other word that kind of goes with vegetarian, and that's an herbivore. And these animals, if they have teeth, you can look at those teeth and kind of tell which type of food that they would eat just by the shape of them. So if I think of a carnivore, I usually think of teeth that are sharp and pointed like a triangle. They're usually bigger at the gum line and then get sharper and pointier the further you go. So here's an example. Here's a great example. So like this animal, this would be a carnivore. You see those nice triangle shaped teeth? They get, they're wider at the top and then kind of are a little bit more triangle at the bottom, pointier at the bottom. Does anybody know what this is? Scary. Scary. <laughs> it is very weird looking. Um, this is an animal that most people really, really like. The alligator. Great guess. So alligator is one of the ones that oh, we normally get. get All right, hold on one second. Um, so an alligator is usually what we get. It does look very alligator-like, but this is actually what an alligator looks like. So alligators have a much wider face, um, and then they have a much um, wider snout, and then they have actual noses at the end like this. The nose on this animal, you ready, is right here. That's literally the nose of this animal. All right, so who got it? Somebody got, got it right? What several of them said dolphin. Great job, everybody. Nice. This is a dolphin. This is a bottlenose dolphin, in fact. And it looks kind of weird because dolphins have, um, they're able to echolocate. So they're able to send out those clicks and whistles into their environment, and then it bounces um, on the whatever is in front of them and then kind of comes back. They're able to process it through their jaw and then up into their brain. Um, but that part of the, the part that the clicks and whistles go out of is not made out of bone and it sits right here. So you think of the dolphin, it has that kind of forehead, that bumpy forehead, that's all made out of fat, acoustic fat. So when we look at the skeleton, we don't see that fat, we just see kind of a dent. And it makes it kind of interesting. So sometimes something that we know exactly what it looks like from pictures, the skeleton could still look very different. Pretty neat, right? So those sharp pointy teeth, so then would this be a carnivore? Yes. Yeah, so nice sharp pointy teeth. This is a python. What about this one? <laughs> would this be a carnivore and also does anybody know what it is shark yes great shark. job yeah this is a shark and sharks are actually this bone on a shark is made out of cartilage it's not necessary it's not the same material as our bones um but they still consider them vertebrates because they have a skeleton um, so yeah, Ow. it's really <laughs> sharp. <laughs> I always, sharp. I always accidentally get bit by this shark. <laughs> um, so carnivore. What about something like this? Would you say that this is probably a carnivore too? <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, no. Yes. No, no, yes. Yes. No, I got a mix. Mix. Okay. That one is hard, definitely, because it doesn't it's have the more. just like perfect, sharp, pointy teeth. So it has kind of the sharp, pointy teeth in the front, but then towards the back, it has a little bit more flat teeth. 
So this is, this is actually a polar bear. So we would consider this a carnivore, but that doesn't mean that polar bears don't sometimes eat vegetables. We do feed our, our polar bears some like lettuce around here. It's not their favorite, <laughs> but we do feed that to them. Um, and they could eat vegetables out in nature. So you're seeing a little bit more in the polar bear, the omnivore teeth. Omnivore teeth are gonna be the ones that have pointy, but then also flat teeth. So if you think about us, here we go. My friend, the human. <laughs> this is Gregory. Um, I just made that up. That's my cousin's name. <laughs> but here's, here's what an omnivore teeth would look like. So they would have, just like if you can use kind of your tongue to kind of feel your teeth too, like this. It's not a real human. No, it is not a real human. It's plastic. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess I should have called it plastica. Uh, so th they have pointier, more triangle teeth in the front, and then they have more flat teeth, more square teeth in the back. Why do you think an omnivore needs pointy teeth and flat teeth? Any guesses? So pointy teeth and flat teeth. Why do you think an omnivore would need pointy teeth and flat teeth? Mm. We'll also have this one. Yeah, rip and grind. Yeah, so they need to, they need to rip and they also need to grind um, because they're eating both meat and plants. So like this animal right here, um, it has those nice flat teeth in the back and then it has those more sharp teeth in the front. So this would also be, if I looked at this, oh, that's an omnivore. And it can be tricky sometimes because sometimes those teeth still look pretty sharp. Can anybody see these teeth right here? So if an omnivore has um, sharp pointy triangle teeth and flat, square teeth, then an herbivore should only have what shaped teeth? Our carnivore have triangle shaped teeth, omnivore have triangle and square. Flat. Right, very good. So our, our herbivores would have more um, flat. square flat, flat teeth, very good. And it can be hard sometimes because if you kind of look at this antelope, you can see it still kind of looks a little pointy in some places, but for most of it, it is still kind of wide and flat um, for chewing, like we, everybody said earlier. Good job, everybody. So carnivores, more triangle, um, herbivores, more square, and then omnivores right in the middle. Usually that the square, uh, the, usually the square teeth are in the back mm -hmm. and the more triangle teeth are in the front because we usually bite in the front and then chew in the back. Great job, everybody. So I have one last friend that I wanted to show you all today. And this is one of my favorites. It's a brand new animal that we have in, well, somewhat brand new. They've been here for almost a year now. Um, but um, a newer animal in our animal ambassador world. And the reason that I left them for the end is because they have such a neat skeleton. Um, that is my friend. I have a Galapagos tortoise that I want to bring out. Now, those of you that know how big Galapagos tortoises might have been sitting like, how are you going to bring a Galapagos tortoise out? These are baby, or this is a baby Galapagos tortoise. It's a very young tortoise, um, about two-ish years. Um, and this tortoise was born at Riverbanks uh, Zoo down in Columbia, South Carolina. And um, they are, were brought here so that eventually we'll be able to have them out for you to see. They're animal ambassadors right now, though. Um, so they do these types of programs because they're still quite small. Now, I'm saying Galapagos tortoise, but that's actually kind of a little misleading. Um, Galapagos tortoises are like a group of tortoises. This specifically is a Western Santa Cruz Island giant tortoise. Now you see why we usually say a type of Galapagos tortoise. <laughs> Very long name, but that is the specific type of Galapagos tortoise it is. And they are so cool because of this amazing structure that they have right here, their shell. Now my question for all of you are, it, 
can turtles come out of their shell? Yes or no? And survive. I've taught enough of these. Yes, no. Okay, so we have some yeses, some noes. So we have um, on TV a lot, they'll, in cartoons, they'll show turtles coming out of their shells and it being totally fine. But in reality, turtles and tortoises and terrapins too, they're all very similar, they are attached to this shell. And I'm gonna have Nikki bring over, she's gonna wheel it over, because like I said, if you know anything about Galapagos tortoises, you know how big they get. She's going to wheel over a full grown Galapagos tortoise shell. Pretty amazing, right? You can't even see all of it because it's so big. But the reason I wanted to show this is because you can see so well on the inside why this shell is so important to the turtle or the tortoise. What, does anybody know what this is in the middle? And then kind of what, it, what this is, what part of the body it is surrounding it? Think about it kind of as a person. Any guesses? It's fine. It's fine, yes. So that is their backbone. It is literally the shell, their backbone. And the other kind of cool thing about it is kind of coming out from that is their ribs. So the shell is truly their backbone and their ribs. And it is protecting kind of all the softer parts inside. And then they do have the bottom shell down here. So that's almost like a big sternum, if you will. Does everybody know your sternum's right here? That's our, we also call that the breastbone. Um, so this shell is with them their whole entire life. It would have started like this, and then it grows as they grow. And Galapagos tortoises can get upwards of, some of the largest is almost a thousand pounds. So they are, they are pretty big at full grown. Now that can take years, years. And I'm, by years, I mean Galapagos tortoises average 100 years old. <laughs> so they can live to be very long. Um, so it will take him decades to get this big. Um, so he'll, he'll, he will slowly get bigger and bigger. But this shell is truly their backbone and their ribs. Now on top of the shell, which one of these came off, hold on. On top of the shell, let's see if I can get it, there we go. On top of the shell is, maybe I need to say that one more time. If this is a scoot, and it is a protective layer of that bone, kind of like how we talked about the hoof, um, of the zebra foot. It is an extra protective layer because that bone is truly so important to them that they don't want anything to hurt it. And so they have the scoot to kind of take um, all of the outside, um, the outside world. So if anything kind of scratches on it or anything like that. But mm -hmm. so Wallace, this is Wallace. I'm gonna bring him up real close. He is um, a Western Santa Cruz Island giant tortoise, a Galapagos tortoise. <laughs> do we know how old he is? Um, we do know how old he is. Now, I don't remember the exact date that he was born, but he was born in either June or July of 2018. So he is almost two years old. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm used to have people being able to see my whole entire body, not just right here. Um, so, um, Wallace, pretty amazing animal. Um, they are critically endangered, and that's one of the reasons that we have them at the zoo, um, because zoos and aquariums all across the world are working together to try to help the numbers of these animals um, go up. And so they have had some born at the Riverbank Zoo, um, and we're able to take care of them um, and help make sure that there are more of these amazing animals in the world, basically. And also learning about the ones that are in the Galapagos right now and help protect, help protect their habitats as well. Do you have a question? We do. What's the difference between a tortoise and a turtle? Great question. So um, there are different types. I'm gonna push this out a little bit out of the way. <laughs> um, there, so all turtles, the group of turtles, there are three different types in there. There's turtle, tortoise, and terrapin. Um, 
and turtles are a little bit different than tortoises um, based on where they live. They, turtles are more aquatic usually, while tortoises tend to be either more desert or just further away from the water. Tortoises also tend to have a more curved dome shell, while um, not all of them, but most of them do, um, while turtles tend to have a, a little bit of a flatter shell. And then terrapins live in brackish water. That is, does anybody know what brackish water is? Um, so they, they, they are specifically adapted to brackish water, which um, brackish water, if anybody has said it, we'll see it. Okay, brackish water is, there you go, great job, a mixture of kind of where the fresh water and the salt water are. So um, terrapins are able to, to go back to be in that kind of semi-salty, semi-fresh water, basically. And that's the easiest way for me to tell them apart. Um, there are some other things as well, but sometimes it can be very hard because like box turtles look more tur tortoise-like, while desert tortoises have really flat shells. <laughs> so there's always exceptions to rules. Somebody wants to know if that big shell is real. Oh, great question. This big shell is real. This is from one of the um, kind of, um, was it one of ours? It was one of ours. One of our first two animals that we had at the North Carolina Zoo, we had two Galapagos tortoises named Tort and Retort, some of the best names I've ever heard. <laughs> um, and I'm not joking, I love it. And um, when they passed away, which the zoo was created in 1974-ish, um, those turtles were already pretty large and full grown. So, um, so when they passed away, we were able to have this shell back. And it's a great way to show just how big these Galapagos tortoises are going to be. It's a pretty amazing bio fact. Okay, good question. Okay, quick question. Okay. Can turtles get as big as a tortoise? Can turtles get as big as a tortoise? Um, yeah, so there's the leatherback turtle, which is a very, very large aquatic turtle. It lives in the sea. It's not aquatic. It's sea. Well, it is, but sea turtle. <laughs> Doesn't live in fresh water. They can get 600 pounds. They are giant turtles as well. So yeah, there are some turtles. Not as many turtles, I would say, that can get that big, but there are definitely some pretty big turtles. And sea turtles can get pretty big because they don't have to worry about gravity in the water as much. That's also why um, you can get really big whales and stuff like that. So when you're on land, you have to contend with gravity. When you're in the water, you have less gravity. So a lot of times they can get bigger. So do people hunt turtles? Oh, okay, so great question. And that's gonna be my last question because we gotta head out, even though I'd love to answer every question that you have. But um, do people hunt turtles? And the story of the Galapagos tortoise actually has to deal with that. So one of the things that the Galapagos tortoise um, was known for way back in the day was that it was really good food on ships. And the reason is because they were so big so they could feed a lot of people and they also didn't have to eat very often. They could go a year without eating. And so people would put them on ships and use them as food. And so, yeah, some people do eat turtles. Um, and so, and it doesn't, I would say it doesn't, it doesn't happen in North America um, as much or the United States as much, but I'm not sure as to where all in the rest of the world um, people might eat um, turtles. But for the Galapagos turtle, tortoise specifically, that was a huge problem for them and why their numbers went down so quickly. So people put restriction on it and allowed them not to be able to take them or hunt them and bring them onto their ships anymore. And that's kind of helped protect them um, as well. Great questions, everybody. I am so excited we got to hang out today. And I hope you learned some really amazing stuff about how to be a bone detective, um, whether to know the shape of the animal, how it moves around, maybe where it came from in the body, um, or if the animal was um, healthy or not. All of these different things go together, can make you a bone detective and help you ID bones that you see maybe pictures of or happen to see in a, in a yard or anything like that. Now make sure everybody will be doing this every Thursday for the time being, uh, for the foreseeable future. So make sure if you haven't already signed up for multiples of these um, that you go and you sign up. We're going, we have a lot of really fun stuff to share with you and more animal ambassadors for you to meet. And we hope everybody has a safe rest of your day. And thanks for hanging out with us virtually, everybody. Bye.